Now, I want to talk about as kind of an intro to the message today as we talk about this final judgment. This is the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 25, the entire chapter. If you have a red letter edition, they're in red letters, meaning they're words that Jesus actually spoke. We're going to determine on the early end of this message that in the beginning, at the final judgment, based on what we would be able to see and make judgments, that we can't distinguish who's getting into heaven and who's not. Can we go ahead and establish that fact right now? I don't have the ability to know your heart. Neither do you have the ability to know my heart. We look at a lot of superficial things that are indistinguishable to us, and we don't know know if it's this, we don't know if it's that. Guess what? We can take a lot of pressure off ourselves. It's not our business to judge somebody else whether they're going to make it or not. Our job is to love them and to share the truth of the gospel of Jesus with them and hopefully they will choose to follow him. Think about it in this way as it relates to things that are indistinguishable. When it comes to jewelry, I'm not a jewelry expert. If you had a fake diamond, a man-made diamond, and you had a real diamond, I would not be able to look at those two and make a, a decision as to which one is the genuine article and which one is not. I hope my wife doesn't have the ability to distinguish. (laughs) When I give her jewelry, I say things like, don't you worry about getting it appraised for insurance purposes. I'll take care of that. (laughs) Because I may not want her to know. When it comes to money, one of the things that plagues our society is very common and rampant is is counterfeit money. And some of the stuff is so good that you and I couldn't just look at it and say, oh, this is counterfeit. It it takes an expert in the field to determine whether or not it is real. Sometimes we have trouble distinguishing between people. Have you ever gotten confused in your mind and, and... one particular person, and you, you got in your mind that is their name and then the, somebody else, and you swap names with people. Am I the only one that's ever done that? It is a bad habit that I have. I remember on one occasion we were at the door over to Eden to campus greeting people, and they came in, and I spoke to the guy when he came in, and my wife said, not very politely and courteously to me either, right out loud, she said, that's just not his name. And I said back, not so politely, I said, yes, it is. I've known him for years. She turned back, she said, tell him what your name is. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to. (laughs) And for whatever reason, I had given him another name. That's how I associated him. And I'd called him by the name for years, and he always answered by it. There's another occasion, there was a city we once lived in, and uh, my wife and I were together one day, and I saw this particular individual, and I looked at them, and I said, oh, I, oh, I feel so sorry for them, my heart goes out to them. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I saw this individual just a few weeks ago, and they were about 30, 40 pounds lighter than they are now. True story. And I said just a few weeks prior to that I saw them. And they were back up here. And and I've I've run across them in the course of the past probably 18 months. And every time I'd see them, they fluctuated from this extreme down to this extreme. And I said, I don't know what they're going through. And I I just know they got an emotional toll here and, and struggle. And I said, I feel so sorry for them. She looked at me. She said, idiot, they are twins. I didn't know. <laughs> she, she said sad. <laughs> so sometimes things are indistinguishable, aren't they? And we're going to see that in our story here today. And we find out that Jesus is the one who's qualified to distinguish the difference. In Matthew 25, if you go back and read that entire chapter as you would have this week, 
We see the stories that he gave about the ten bridesmaids or the ten virgins. We often refer to it in dealing with wisdom and preparation in our lives. And then the next time he told a story about the talents and talks about money and investments and opportunities and things that we ought to be preparing for. And then he finishes up the chapter with this issue dealing with sheep and goats and knowing the difference. Matthew chapter 25 beginning at verse 31, the final judgment. And it reads, But when the Son of Man, this is Jesus' own self-title for Himself, that He often referred to Himself, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, speaking of a yet future event, even for us, yet future event, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne, literally to judge the earth, Jesus is coming again. Not to be confused with the rapture of the church when he returns in the clouds in the air and the church is caught up away. Seven years of tribulation take place on the earth. He returns with the angels and all the raptured saints back. There's a conflict that takes place. We often talk about the battle of Armageddon. There's a thousand year millennial reign of absolute peace. And the earth is restored to its former state. And all that that's going to look like. And Jesus will rule out of Jerusalem. Literally, physically, on planet earth from Jerusalem for a thousand year period. And guess what? Those of us who have been faithful to him will help rule and serve throughout the earth during that period of time. This isn't even part of the message, but let me go ahead and give you a little insight. How you serve and your responsibilities will be based largely on part of your faithfulness and the use of your gifts, talents, and abilities that He's given you here in this life. I, don't, I wish I had time. That's a whole other study. But he talks about it in more than one place. He said, if you've been faithful over a little, he said, I'm going to make you ruler over Many in the future. But he's talking about this future event as he's having this conversation. Notice verse 32. He said, all the nations will be gathered in his presence. There is a time coming in the future that when all of humanity that exists on the earth will see Him and be able to hear from Him simultaneously both those who are still lost, and yes, there will be lost people during the millennial reign before the final judgment. And again, that's a, that's a whole in-depth study we don't have time for today. It says they will all, all the nations, the entire earth, will be gathered in His presence. And at that moment and in that season, that hour, that event, to be able to look at another human being, it will be indistinguishable even to us who is going with Him eternally and who is not going with Him eternally. We like to think we know, don't we? I've said it before, I'm convinced when I ultimately get to heaven, there are going to be some people there that I'm going to be surprised when I see them. I'm like, what? Here's the other side of that equation. There are going to be a lot of people when I get there look at me and say, oh, you made it? They're like, what? He actually got here. Listen, we live in a world today where it's not a lot of difference in that it is indistinguishable to us. Again, we don't have the ability, the capability to look at an individual and determine what their heart is as it relates to their walk with Christ. He says, all the nations at that point will be gathered in His presence and He, speaking of Jesus, will separate or divide the people. Whose job ultimately is it to make the decision whether they're getting in or whether they're not? Wh whose is it? It belongs to Jesus. Many, many times in Scripture, Jesus said of the Father had given him all judgment and authority. That God said, you know what? You've been through this process. You've been obedient to me. You're my son. 
I'm going to delegate all of that authority unto you. Notice he did not say, on that day, churches and denominations will separate the people. He did not say, depending on your last name and your heritage, you'll be divided. He did not say based on your social standing or how involved you were in your community will determine whether you're getting in or not. It says on that day, He, Jesus, will separate the people because at that moment the masses are indistinguishable. And notice how he will go about this process. It says, He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. We ran across this video this week that I thought was a good illustration of that because one of the primary ways that a shepherd leads sheep is by his voice. In fact, Jesus even said that. He said, The sheep know my voice, and another they will not follow. Look, it's as simple as this today. If you are listening to the voice of Jesus and doing your best to follow him, then you are one of his sheep. And if you're not listening to him and you're not following, then you probably aren't. It gets real challenging, doesn't it? But see, we're going to discover through this message today the final judgment is the final judgment. Not an appeal process after the fact. Not trying to make your case later. There is a finality to the judgment that comes based on how we have lived our lives. And so if we could take for just a moment, I want to share this brief clip from this video showing the impact of a shepherd being able to lead by his voice. Can you roll that for me? And literally, as you see here, there's a group of people gathering. They're doing this experiment, and, and these other people are trying to call the sheep to them. Just, just watch. So he says he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. They are only going to listen and respond to the voice of the shepherd. Jesus himself said, I am what? The good shepherd and the sheep know my voice. So one of the ways he's going to make this division and this separation at the final judgment is he's simply going to speak and he's also going to base it on the fact that we have heard his voice previously and what we decided to do with it when we heard it. I can tell we're a little slow out of the gates this morning. As believers and Christ followers, Christians, it is a dangerous thing for us to claim to be a Christ follower and disciple and either not listen to the voice of Jesus or worse, to hear His voice and then choose not to follow Him. He said there's coming a day when this final judgment happens and so much of the determination that Jesus is going to make, he's going to make the separation and the division, is going to be based on what did you do with his voice when he spoke to you. Now, I'm not talking about an audible voice like you're hearing me, but I'm talking about a prompting inside of you when you knew right from wrong. I'm talking about reading the Word of God because that is the voice of God speaking directly to you. That's why it's so important we're going through the Bible together because that is the written Word of God. He's saying, what did you do when you heard my voice, when you heard my bidding, when you heard my invitation? Did you come? And when I gave you commands and instructions on how to live, did you do those things or not? That's part of the process that he's going to use to make the division and the separation. It is not going to be based on the fact that you attended a church for 47 years in a row. It's absolutely true. Now, do we want you to attend church regularly and worship together? Absolutely. But that's not going to get it. 
The fact that your grandma was considered a saint and your parents were good, godly people doesn't mean you're getting a free pass in. It's a personal choice and decision. The question is, have you listened to the voice of Jesus to come to him to begin with, to be a follower, to be a disciple, to be part of the sheep fold and flock? And if you have, have you listened to him and have you chosen to obey him? Now, he says he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep. We've already discovered one of the primary ways he's going to make that distinction is what have we done, how we responded to his voice. And secondly of all, shepherds would have consistently had with them, and we see this throughout Scripture all over the place, both a rod and a staff. We're familiar with the 23rd Psalm, probably the most familiar passage of Scripture there is. Particularly a psalm says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thy rod and your staff, they comfort me. Two, two separate instruments for two different purposes. But a way a shepherd would have divided animals that day, sheep and goats as well, would have been the rod and the staff. We like the comfort part. We like, oh, this is protection. If anything comes against me, I can pray and call out to him, and he's going to defend me and going to fight off my enemies. Listen, that's all a wonderful thing. But do you understand there also were times when using the rod and the staff were necessary to correct the sheep? If I had a staff, that would be the one with the crook neck. I'd reach out and grab somebody right now with it. (laughs) Because there are times, listen, don't despise the day of judgment of God if you are a sheep. I use this term often when I'm talking to people that are struggling going through things in their life. I'll say, he loves us too much to leave us as we are where we are. And if that means he has to get the staff out and snatch us a little bit and get our attention, he will. And then there are some of us. I'm I'm pointing at me, not at you. There are some of us that are hard-headed and stubborn at times. Now, don't look at anybody beside you. Right now. It's like, yeah, that's it. He's talking to you now. That the gentle nudge of the staff around the leg or even the neck, that prodding to come back in this direction and get back over here is insufficient. And the very instrument that he uses to protect them, sometimes he has to use for a different purpose. I would challenge you to go back just today and and do a Google search on discipline and correction in Scripture and see how many times the Word of God talks about how a father, if he loves his son, will correct and discipline him. There's a biblical application that God loves us so much that there are times... Listen, what I am not saying is that every time you go through a pain or struggle, heartache, trial, difficulty, that it's God correcting. I'm not saying that at all, but I do know from personal experience there have been times in my life that I knew it was the correction of God, the, the rod of correction in order to get my attention and get me back where I needed to be. And so he said, I'm going to make that division, I'm going to make that separation as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And then he says, on that occasion, on that day, in front of everybody, he will place the sheep at his, what, right hand and the goats at his left. Bear with me just a minute. Vince, do you mind coming forward? DJ, do you mind coming up? <laughs> Don't be bad. Just stay, just stay right there. Just so. <laughs> now, see, it, it would be, in fact, turn around just a minute and face, face these folks. I just randomly picked these because they were close by. It would be easy for us to look at these individuals 
based on a lot of situations and circumstances and to make a judgment about what's on the inside of their heart when, in fact, we don't know. Right? <laughs> Let's take DJ, for instance. You know I love you, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> this is all just hypothetical now. This is just, just for illustration purposes only. Now listen, this seems so bizarre and far out in left field, but it's a sad reality that some people would look at this young man who's made an effort to get up and take a shower and come to church today. <laughs> yes, and... <laughs> you did. You did. And come to church today and sit right here on the second row, which is territory most of you have never been in before. <laughs> and say, wait, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know why and where he, he wears his hair so doggone long. Because from the back, I, I, thought, I thought it was that man's girlfriend. But don't we make judgments on the most foolish of things when we don't know what's in the heart? Yes. Amen. And we can look over here and, and we can say, oh, well, this man right here now, he's in church every Sunday and he plays on the stage and he serves in, in six different community places and, and I've seen him drop money in the offering plate and he's just got it all together and I know for a fact He's going to get to heaven. This guy over here, he gets here once in a while with his long hair, and I'm not even sure about him. But do you see how ridiculous we are when we make decisions about people? Yeah. What we see on the outside? Yeah. And we don't have a clue what's on the inside because here's what I'm 100% convinced of. There are a lot of people that we pass by the way, and we've already prejudged them as not part of the sheep, and their hearts are a lot closer to Jesus than ours are a lot of times. Yeah. That's the reality of it. And some people we look at so holy and religious and righteous and pious, and we think, oh, my goodness, they got it all together. If we could see on the inside of the heart. We, mm. Even Jesus said that to the religious people. He said, you got it all whitewashed and cleaned up and painted real pretty on the outside. He said, inside your life, you got like dead man's bones, just like a rotten cave in here with the decay and the rotten stench inside of it. Jesus said, there's coming a time, not you, not me. He said, but I'm going to make the distinction. I'm going to look at them. You guys can turn around and look in, in, to me right now. And he's going to judge the heart of an individual. And he's going to say, he... Remember, he's the shepherd. He's going to say, DJ, come on over here. Come on over here. And, and see, he's over here. And y'all say, yeah, I knew he was going to be on the left-hand side. And no, he's not because I'm going to place him over here. Ha, ha, ha. You, you, you don't matter. You can face me. You can face them. Don't make any difference. And for all the things that this guy has done that we said, you know what? If anybody's ever going to get in, it's him. And we don't know the dark secrets of his heart and the blackness of sin that's embedded in there that hasn't been dealt with or that he refuses to deal with. We've just seen all the exterior stuff. And on that day of judgment, though, he said, this, this is what's going to happen. He said, I, I'm going to make that division, and, and I'm going to decide who's on the left and who's on the right. It's past time for us to get out of the sheep and goat judging business yes, and get in the serving Jesus and loving people business yes, and let him make those distinctions and choices yes. that only he's qualified yes. to do. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Got to roll on. Verse 34. We're going to get some insight again, to why he's going to make the decisions that he's going to make on that final judgment day. Verse 34. Then the king, which is Jesus, remember he talked about a future event when he's going to sit on a throne and rule the world from it. Then the king will say to those on his right, now who's on the right? What, what group? Sheep that he's already divided. He's going to say to this group over here, those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom, that's eternally because we're part of the family of God if you are a believer. You've responded to the invitation of Jesus to come to him. Notice he said, prepared for you 
from the creation of the world. Do you understand? It was never God's plan or intent for anybody to be lost and suffer eternally in hell. That was never His plan. That came as a result of the fall of man, sin that entered into the world. He said from the beginning, from the creation of the world, it was His destiny, His design, His purpose, His hope that everybody would live eternally with Him. Think about John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that whosoever... Is this invitation open to everybody? Yes, it is, but you have to respond to his invitation. He said, verse 35, as he talks to this group of sheep on the right that he's made this division. You're tracking with me in the story. Everybody indistinguishable. He makes the divisions, goats, sheep, and now he's addressing this group over here. He said, for I was hungry. Jesus speaking about himself. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Now listen, if he has that conversation in the future and we're in the group of masses of people, I and all of you both would be thinking, well, you know what? I've not even had the privilege until now to even see Jesus. Right? I mean, logically, in the flesh, right? It's not a trick. And then you're going to want to know, like these are going to want to know, how and when in the world this happened. But I want to go back and look at that. There are six categories that Jesus said. The reason I can make this distinction so easily is based on how you lived your life. And he gives these categories. He starts out. He said, I was hungry and you fed me. He's not talking about personally and directly did you feed Jesus. But he's talking about every time you saw somebody who had a practical need and you reached out and met it and fed them, you were in essence feeding Jesus. Even if there wasn't a practical need but you shared with them because you just loved and cared for them, you were doing that to Jesus. I sat in a local restaurant this week and I was seated there and I was, I was reading over this and thinking of examples and times when I've had opportunities that, that mirrored some of these categories. And about that time, I saw a, a, a brother in Christ. In fact, he's in the building this morning. I'm certainly not going to, going to point him out, but I saw him pull in the parking lot and I sensed the Holy Spirit said, I want you to do that for him. I want you to feed him this morning. I want you to buy his breakfast. And you know what I did? The same thing that we do sometimes. I'm like, are you sure? (laughs) I'm just being honest with you. And I mean, in a flash, and the next thought ran through my mind, what if he's ordering for the whole crew he works with? And then I thought about the latter part of this where Jesus is going to make a distinction, make a separation based on what you did for me. And I jumped up and I ran to the counter. I said, there's a truck coming around there in just a minute. I said, I want to pay for his breakfast. I didn't even ask how much it was. Now, I'm not going to kid you. When I got the receipt back, it was only $2.82. I said, yes, yes, yes. (laughs) Now listen, here's the truth of the matter. I could have paid for everybody's breakfast that came in the store or came through the drive-thru that morning, and I could have done it with a begrudging heart and a judgmental attitude and spirit, and there would have been absolutely zero reward for me in the future based on it. But I could, as I did that moment, respond to what I felt like was the prompting of the Holy Spirit to do just a simple act of kindness for somebody, to let them know I care, I'm thinking about you, I love you, and go up there. Even if it was only $2.82, there was a reward attached to that because I did it for the right reason. 
And that's what Jesus is talking about. He said that there are opportunities all around us. And that's really the, 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 the main focus of this message is to heighten our awareness of opportunities to love people in the name of Jesus. And he said, there are times when I was hungry and you fed me and you, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And he goes through this list and category of stuff. And I was in prison and you visited me. Listen, you say, well, I'm not going to the prison. I know how rough that place is. Certainly, Bertie Correctional Center is a prison. That, that would include it. But can I tell you, somebody who is in Three Rivers Rehabilitation Center that can't get out and don't know if and when they're getting out or in a physical type of prison. And listen, I'm not talking about the facility and bashing them. I'm talking about their inability to get out and have mobility and do things on their own. Do you understand it's vitally important that we reach out to those people? I know some of you don't like those environments and those settings. Can I tell you, neither do I. But when I think of those people and how much it means to them, and you go in there and you see their faces light up and tears run down their face, and you, you spend some time with them talking and laughing and praying with them, it means the world to them. And listen, if you need some motivation to get out of your comfort zone, to go over there in other places like it, to spend a few minutes with people and love on them, just when you go in there and look at them, Think that you're looking at Jesus because you are. When you serve them, you are serving Jesus. If it's for the right reason, the right motivation, and the right heart. Then verse 37, after he goes through this process, they're going to ask him the question, when and how did all this happen? But listen, before we do that, I want to make crystal clear that we leave here with the understanding you are not saved or in right relationship with God because of what you do. We, we need to understand that. But if you are in relationship with him, there are some things you're going to do. Even if it's not convenient. Even if it's not comfortable. In fact, let me read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Clarify that, and then we're going to go back into our passage. I just want to make this crystal clear. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Are we crystal clear? That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying you do enough good long enough that it tips the scales and eventually you get into heaven. It's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is if you're genuinely in relationship with Jesus, you're going to want to serve Him and serve other people. And in serving other people, you're directly serving Him. Now back to our passage, verse 37. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and gave you something to drink or a stranger show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? Because there, remember now, there's a group over here and maybe you're in this group and you're saying, wait a minute, I never saw you. I didn't give you something to eat. I didn't give you something to drink. You weren't in prison. You were 2,000 years ahead of me when I lived on the earth. How in the world does this apply to me, and this is verse 40, and the king, Jesus, will say, I tell you the truth. When you, what is it? When you, what? When you, when you, not when you thought about it. Not when it crossed your mind and you didn't do it. Not when you passed it off to somebody else because you didn't want to do it. Not because you had good intentions that you never followed through with. He said, I tell you the truth, when you did it. Good intentions on their own without follow through are useless. He said, when you did it, when you actually took action, he said, 
to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, part of the family of God. And listen, I want to make this clarity too because I know some of you will hang on to this and say, well, based on that, brothers and sisters, that means fellow Christians. And so therefore, I, I don't have an obligation even if I have an opportunity to serve other people outside. First of all, we've already established the fact that you and I don't have the ability to judge a heart and know. And even if we think we do, the primary response first is to the people of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, but it's not exclusionary to everybody else. Are, are you with me? He said, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters. Now, remember now, all the sheep he separated, he's put over here. There's this massive group of people he has said, you've done these things for me. They said, when do we do it? And he said, and, and as the group, he said, I, I, no doubt in my mind, he's pointing out to me, and you look around and you say, when you did it to one of the least of these, oh, when you did it for the, the single parent over here that was struggling. Christmas time came around, and out of the goodness of your heart, you helped provide Christmas for them because you didn't want those kids who are victims in their situation to go lacking. He said, when you did that, you did it to me. He said, when you provided a, a shoebox for kids somewhere around the world that's in abstract poverty that got this and it changed their life because they've never gotten anything this significant before in their life and they heard the truth about Jesus. He said, when you did that, you did it unto me. Do you realize these shoe boxes are the same as sending them on to Jesus? He said, when you were in the grocery store the other day and there was an elderly person up there and they had to put back a few items because they didn't have enough money to get by because their Social Security is so meager and that's all they live on. And something touched your heart and you stepped up and you said, it's okay, put it all back in there. I've got this. I want to bless you. He said, you were doing that to me. When you think about somebody and... They've been going through a difficult time. It may be sickness. It, it, it may be a family problem. I don't know what it may look like, but you're prompt. You think of them, and you, you send them a text. You said, I'm thinking about you. I love you. I care for you. I pray for you. Or you write out a card and send it to them. Do you understand? That's the same as sending it to Jesus. Because you are serving people. You are serving Him. And on this occasion... When they asked the question, he said, When you did it to one of the least of these, these who were lonely and hurting and vulnerable and weak, neglected, abandoned, suffering, he said, You did it unto me. And I know some folks, including myself, at times struggle knowing when, where, and how to help people. Here, here's the simplest answer I can give you. This is what I live by. If I sense the Holy Spirit touch my heart in any kind of way and said, I want you to do this, whether it makes sense to me or not, then that's what I try to do. And, and I, know, I know a lot of you are like me, and you're thinking, well, I know some people don't really need it, and that's just what they do, and they're taking advantage of me. Listen, I want to be a good steward, and I try very hard to do that. But listen, I'd rather occasionally be taken advantage of and do it with the right heart and motive than to never be obedient and never serve people and never serve Jesus. He says, when you've done it unto one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. And we're almost, almost done. Verse 41, then the king will turn to those on the left. This is the other group. He said, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, originally prepared for who? The devil and his demons. I told you in the beginning, when God created everything, it was perfect. The earth was perfect. Perfect. The Garden of Eden where he put Adam and Eve. They were perfect people until they sinned and they no longer were. Then the curse of sin entered into man. Man was designed, people were designed to live forever. And that's why back in the beginning you see where they were living 900 years and then 800 years and 700 years right on down digressing. And the earth has been cursed repeatedly because of sin but it's all going to be restored. And he will say to them originally that, that hell was created for the devil and his demons. But scripture also says that it's been enlarged and it's being enlarged to accommodate the folks going there. Listen, we need to understand this very clearly. I don't want you to leave 
without knowing this and understanding this very clearly. There is a judgment day coming, and there are only two options for eternity. It is heaven or hell. And I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to upset anybody. I, I just want to do my job. The invitation is being sent to you by Jesus today if you don't know him. Because there is coming a finality. Listen, death, when you draw your final breath, that's not the end. That's the beginning of eternity. Jesus will make the ultimate judgment decision, but it's heaven or it's hell. It's that simple. How will you respond to his imitation? They go through this same list. He says, you had all these opportunities and never did that because that's reflective of your heart. Listen, it's not our nature to serve people and to give and to sacrifice. And, and, but the closer we are in relationship with Jesus, the easier that becomes for us. Salvation has never been, never will be based on works or what we do. But I'm going to make this bold statement today. You can't have genuine salvation and relationship with Jesus without serving and sacrificing sometimes for people. And in turn, you're doing it for Him. Look at verse 45. We're done. And He will answer, I'll tell you the truth. Notice, it's very important. i tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, you are refusing to help me. Why is that so important? Because that means you had knowledge. Very clearly you had an opportunity. You knew it was the right thing to do. You had the ability. He says, but you refused. Now, have I ever missed the prompting of the Holy Spirit to help, to reach out? to serve, to do something, the answer unequivocally is yes. And can I tell you, it's the most horrific feeling there is when I know I've missed an opportunity or disobeyed. But that's not what I desire to do. My heart is to listen to the voice of the shepherd. Be obedient. He says, but if you refuse, you refuse, you refuse, it's an indicator of your heart. He ends with 46. They will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. It's a difficult message to preach because it's straight forward. But we need to be reminded we're not in the judgment business, He is. Our job is to love, serve Him and people. And help them as much as we can on that journey and that invitation to meet Jesus and then become a disciple for Him as well. For somebody maybe in this room or listening online, this moment will be the most important moment not only in this life but for all eternity whether or not you respond to his voice of invitation today listen you, you don't have to get all things in order and cleaned up you don't have to understand everything you don't have to be able to quote the Bible from beginning in you just have to respond to his invitation to come because he's already done the work he's paid the price he's given his life he's shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Heads bowed. Just a few moments as we linger in the presence of God. We're going to pray just a moment. This first question is directed to those who've never responded to the invitation to come to Jesus. And you know He is speaking to your heart gently and tenderly. He's, he's saying, come to me. You may not understand it all. That's perfectly fine. But you realize that Jesus is the only way to be in right standing with God. And on that final judgment day, you want to hear him say, you're on my right-hand side. You're, you're in the group of eternal bliss and joy in my presence in heaven. You've never made that choice and decision. But with God's help, to the best of your ability, you want today to be the, the moment of 
change in your life, you're going to make that decision to follow Jesus. Just slip your hand up. People aren't moving. People aren't looking around. This is your time. This is your invitation. He said to refuse is where the danger comes in. For the rest of us, and, and I'm in this group, my, my hand's already lifted. You need and want to do a better job at recognizing the opportunities and then responding and serving other people for the right reason. Not to be seen, not to show off, not to impress, not to earn a bunch of rewards you can redeem, cash in later. But you want to love Jesus by loving other people just in a general, practical application day to day. And you want to be sensitive to those opportunities and have the courage to respond if that's your genuine heart's prayer just raise your hand right now mine's already up because yes thank you all over this place Lord I thank you for the simplicity and the clarity of your word today that has made it easy for us to understand that you desire us to be in a relationship with you and to come to you as the good shepherd Thank you for this sobering reminder that there is coming a, a day of judgment when you will make the decision whether we go into eternal punishment of hell or eternal joy and celebration with you and the saints. And that depends on whether we are in right standing with you in that relationship. For those who have not made that choice and decision, that you are drawing, that you are inviting. I pray that your Holy Spirit continue to deal with them. You would gently but continuously draw them till they make a choice and decision to surrender and become a part of the family of God. Lord, for those of us who have already made that decision and responded to that invitation, we've seen so importantly how we respond to the practical needs of others around us is an indication of our heart and our relationship with you. When we stand before you, we certainly want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And part of that will be based on whether or not we fed you, we gave you something to drink, or we spent time with you, we visited you, we clothed you, we cared for you through practical ways of people here on this earth. Lord, most of these people responded this morning that they recognize a need and want to respond in a greater measure than they have before with the right heart and the right motivation. I pray that you give us wisdom to see the opportunities because they're all around us. Give us hearts of love and compassion to reach out to them. May we do it as if we are serving you because in fact that is exactly what we are doing we thank you for your word speaking so clearly to us in Jesus name amen as we ponder on this message for just a minute I, I want to leave you with this thought we're getting ready to share communion in just a minute but before that I, I, I want to challenge you with this thought I want you to be intentional this week serving people. B-E-E -E, as in a honey bee. Be intentional to serve people. I, I found some interesting facts this week as I was reading about honey bees. And I did not know a lot of these things that the honey that they produce that has been untouched, it's unfiltered, it, it's unpasteurized and unprocessed, that it is antibacterial. It's antiviral. It is antifungal. It boosts your immune system. And it is one of the most beneficial topical antiseptics for wounds and burns that's ever been discovered by man. I was also fascinated to learn that honeybees only live from 30 to 120 plus days. That's, that's all they live. But their life is spent in service and sacrifice. The article I was reading said they, this is phenomenal, they spend an average of flying approximately 48,000 miles in their short lifespan, going and gathering nectar, spreading pollen, and then making honey during their short life cycle. 
They work diligently to keep the hive at a constant temperature of about 92 to 95 degrees. In the wintertime, they huddle together. They literally have each other's back to maintain the heat. And in the summer, they spread out and fan their wings to cool each other. Their life is all about serving other than them sales. And then I was overwhelmed to discover this, that in their short lifetime with all their service and sacrifice, that the best they could hope to produce is about one tablespoon of honey in their lifetime. What am I saying? You may spend your lifetime giving and working feverishly to help others and to serve other people and to serve the kingdom of God. And you say, I've got so little to offer. Can I tell you that little bit of honey that you produce in your life by your service means the world to the people who are consuming it. All of these benefits I just talked about that the honey produces is available only because they were willing to give of themselves sacrificially consistently, repetitively just to provide that little dose of honey. Can I tell you there is somebody in your life that is desperate for a dose of honey this week? You understand what I'm saying? And whether or not they receive all of those blessings and benefits and the sweetness that life can sometimes offer, it's going to be dependent on whether or not you and I are obedient in our work and our service and our sacrifice to them for the kingdom of God.